My name is Jay Garfield. I'm joining you from Western Massachusetts, where I teach at Smith College, the Harvard Divinity School, and spend some time at Kyoto University, University of Melbourne, and the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies. My own work focuses on the philosophy of mind and the foundations of cognitive science, especially children's development of concepts pertaining to the self and pertaining to point of view and their understanding of other minds. And I also work a lot in cross-cultural philosophy, joining insights from Indian and Tibetan Buddhist philosophy to work in Western philosophy. This talk is called Second Persons and the Constitution of First Persons. The talk is going to have only a few parts. It's going to be a short talk. After a brief introduction, I'm going to offer some developmental evidence for the fact that second person consciousness is crucial to constructing first person consciousness. I'm then going to shift from infants to adults and talk about the way that the second person perspective is important in constituting adult subjectivity. I'm then going to talk a little bit about why second persons are so important in our ethical experience and conclude with implications for diverse intelligence. The first thing to say is that when I talk about second persons as opposed to first persons, I'm not entering the popular debate about the difference between the first person and the third person perspective on the mind. I know that right now lots of people are talking about the difference between my own first person intimate experience of my own consciousness and the third person experience of others consciousness or the third person experience of my consciousness by others and talking about why those are so different. I honestly don't care at all about that. I'm interested in the so far ignored role of second persons in constituting even first person consciousness. I'm going to show you that the second person is essential for developing our self-understanding, that we develop our understanding of ourselves as first persons, that is, through second person understanding, that second person consciousness is important for constituting our social life, and that second person consciousness is important for understanding morality and moral cultivation. So I'm going to begin with developmental evidence, as I said. A lot of this comes from the work of the contemporary British cognitive developmentalist Vasudevi Reddy. Reddy asks a really interesting question at the beginning of her work. She asks, what does it take to be aware that someone is attending to you? And she immediately resolves this into two subsidiary questions. The first question is, what does it take to recognize another person's attention? That is, when somebody is attending to us, how do we recognize that they're not just one more object in our environment, that they are in fact paying attention to us? The second question though is, what does it take to recognize oneself as the object of their attention? It's one thing you might think, to think that somebody's paying attention to something. Another thing to say, oh my gosh, it's me, a self, to whom they're paying attention. One of the profound results that Vasudevi Reddy demonstrates is that these apparently two questions are in fact the same question. Here is how she puts it as she summarizes the results of some of her important studies. And I'm quoting her now. The awareness of self as the object of another's attention must lead to, rather than result from, representations of self and other as psychological entities. This perspective assumes what one might call a second person approach to the developing awareness of self and other. What does this mean? Here's what it means. We don't begin by my noticing that you are a subject and that I am a subject, that you have a mind, that I have a mind, and then say, oh wow, your mind is paying attention to my mind. Rather, we begin by becoming aware of our dialogical second person interaction and be through our understanding of that interaction, come to be aware of ourselves as participants in that interaction, that is as mutual subjects in dialogue. And this begins very early. Reddy shows that by ages two to four months, infants show affective awareness of gaze. That is, they can understand the difference between a loving gaze and an anxious gaze. They demonstrate coyness, modulating their own gaze to get the attention of others. They can show embarrassment, pride, and pleasure in different kinds of visual regard. That means that infants at this age, at two to four 
months are already representing themselves as in dialogue with their caregivers, even without language. And by six to eight months, we observe gaze monitoring. That is, infants demonstrate awareness of what their caregivers are looking at and attend to that. Again, representing their caregivers as minds, as centers of attention, and themselves as potential sharers of that attention. We can continue to unpack this idea. It's important to see that these are dyadic interactions. These are interactions between infants and others. And these interactions are not just causal interactions, they are dialogical interactions. They involve exchange of information, affective information, perceptual information, and so forth. And when we are in dialogue with one another, we are necessarily interpreting one another. Dialogue involves interpretation. So an infant isn't simply responding to a gaze or to a point or to a gesture. An infant is interpreting it as meaningful. And when an infant offers a gesture or a gaze, the infant is offering it on the assumption that it will be interpreted by the person with whom it is an interaction. That means that infants from the very beginning are adopting second person attitudes towards their adult caregivers, treating them as minds to be addressed and as minds who are addressing them in dialogical interpretable interactions. And to do that, to engage in a second person interaction like that, requires that we are aware that we and the person with whom we're in dialogue have different perspectives, that we know things or feel things that they do not, and that we can communicate to them, that they know things or are aware of things that we do, are not, and that they communicate those things to us. And what that means is that our initial awareness of minds is an awareness of minds as multiple. That is, we are aware that we are one mind among many, not that I have a mind, and then I wonder whether my caregiver has a mind or whether anybody else has a mind. My initial awareness of minds is an awareness of a multiplicity, and so an awareness of myself as one member of that multiplicity. By the time we get to the second and third year of life, we see deception emerging. Toys get hidden, surprises get sprung on people. Sometimes even lies get told. And deception, of course, requires that we represent another person as not knowing something that we know, as again, having a distinct perspective and their own inner life that is different from our own. It's important to see that this emerges long before children are passing so-called theory of mind tests in the fourth year of life. Many people have argued that since children don't pass false belief tests until the age of four, that they're not really aware that others have minds or even that they themselves have minds until the age of four. This, these results, all of this discussion of deception and dialogical interaction in early life shows that that's a misinterpretation and theory of mind tasks are in fact tapping a much more complex suite of cognitive capacities, not the primitive dialogical capacities and second person perspective that really underlies the development of our self-awareness. A little bit more developmental evidence is interesting. A number of researchers, in particular Grossman, Parisi, and Friedrichi, have shown that there's a very distinct neural signature of being aware of address by one's name. So if I call you by your name, a very specific set of brain activity occurs. The cool thing is that that same brain activity occurs when you're addressed by the second person, if I say you. So we represent ourselves not only as people with names, but as people who can be addressed by you, and we represent that in exactly the same way. Moreover, there is much higher affective arousal when we are addressed by someone than when we observe someone addressing someone else. So being addressed is something that we are attuned to experience, and when we experience that, we experience ourselves as being addressed by another as second persons, by someone who we experience as a second person. Moreover, if you think about what it is to receive address, to experience communication from someone else, whether in language or in gesture or in facial expression, that involves a, a deep set of presuppositions. I presuppose that you addressing me take me to be a person, to take me to be an addressee and as someone who could address you. And when I address you, 
I take you to take me to be a mind and a person addressing you and as someone who you could potentially address. So what all of this means is that our very basic awareness of ourselves as subjects emerges in second person interactions. We become aware of ourselves as I by being aware that I am you to you and that you are a you to me. So much for infant subjectivity. Let's talk a little bit about the importance of the second person in adult subjectivity. Very often when we think of how I express first person subjectivity, I do that using the first person pronoun in English with the word I, and that first person consciousness involves the ability to use that special first person pronoun. It's less often remarked that using the first person pronoun is an instance of using language. And when I use language, I use language how to address somebody else. When I say I, I say I to you. And the very fact of language presupposes second person consciousness because language has its place in address. More than that, of course, I, language presupposes meaning. The word I only functions because it's got a meaning, the meaning of the first person pronoun. And meaning, as we know, is constituted by communities of language users who agree tacitly to use words in roughly the same way. That is a bunch of third persons. This means that first person consciousness as expressed in language presupposes both third person consciousness to constitute meaning and second person consciousness to constitute the address that gives language its point. All of this is to say that when we understand ourselves as subjects or as selves, as first persons, we under, understand ourselves as ensemble players, not as soloists. We don't think of ourselves as the only mind in the world and then start talking because there would be nobody to whom to talk and no community to constitute the meaning that would make talk possible. But importantly, we understand ourselves as ensemble players who speak to one another, who always have an audience in mind, a second person, not to some distant impersonal audience. And all of this in turn means that when we think about what our self-understanding looks like, while it's tempting to think of it as simply empirical, we just look inside and find the data. We find out who we are, what it feels like to be me, what's going on in my mind. In fact, it's hermeneutic or interpretive understanding. We understand ourselves as meaningful, as language users, as thinkers, as beings whose thoughts have content. And that is an interpretive or a hermeneutic self-understanding, not a merely empirical understanding. A hermeneutic understanding presupposes meaning. Meaning presupposes language. Language presupposes addressees. Addressees in presuppose the special second person perspective. There is also an important ethical dimension to all of this. Oftentimes when we think about ethical demands and ethical strictures, we think that we're being asked to be disinterested rather than to be self-interested, to treat third persons as we treat ourselves. And this is summed up in the golden rule, of course. Um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat other people as just like you. And you might think, if you reflect on it this way, you might think that this undermines my claim that there is a special role for second persons, but it doesn't. And I want to show you that by showing you that the golden rule is in fact incoherent. We can't generalize our attitude from the first person to the third person. That is, if we think that my first person regard is egoistic, that is, that I care about my own happiness, and to avoid my own unhappiness, and that I should treat you in the same way that I treat myself, that means that I should treat third persons egoistically. And that makes absolutely no sense at all. On the other hand, we very naturally have affective, positive regard and well-wishing for second persons. The people with whom we are intimately involved, to whom we address as you, those are people who we care about. And it does make sense to think that we could extend the natural care that we have for second persons, for our children, for our caregivers, for members of our community, to third persons, extending the realm of what people like Hume have called natural sympathy, 
to a much wider circle. And if we think of moral cultivation as coming to see third persons as more like second persons, as Buddhist philosophers like Shantideva or Scottish philosophers like Hume have independently argued, this makes much more sense of the goal of moral, moral cultivation. One way to put this is that moral life and moral demands are made possible by our species ultra sociality, by the fact that we evolved to live in social environments and those social environments range in size from dyads to families to local communities to nations to the world. And that means that it's possible for us to extend our second person attitudes to broader ranges of people and to treat third persons as second persons. Once again, the second person, it becomes what's foundational to morality rather than just an afterthought in, in a dia dialectic between first person and third person attitudes. Let me conclude by asking what this has to do with diverse intelligence. Well, here's what it has to do with it. First, it's worth noting something that people often don't note. That is that our own intelligence is constituted by and designed for dialogical interaction with others in communities of minds. We have evolved to interact with second persons in broad communities of third persons. So to understand what our intelligence is in the first place requires understanding its essentially social nature. We have to wonder whether this is essential to humanity and whether it's essential to intelligence in general. Is intelligence all second person intelligence? Or is human intelligence, especially second person intelligence? Or that is a way of thinking about this. Is human intelligence one species of a large genus of intelligences? Or is it its own kind of thing because of its sociality? It may well be that any intelligence that does not emerge in second person interactions and that's not designed for second person interactions might be so different from ours that we wouldn't even recognize it, that it would be entirely opaque to us and that we would be opaque to beings intelligent in that way. That's a question we must ask. Another question we might wonder about is this. Could, is it possible that only intelligence that is dialogically constituted, that is second person intelligence, is intelligence with which we could establish a community? It may be that there are other kinds of intelligence, but that we discovered that those are not intelligences with which we could productively interact as addressees or addressors that could be members of our communities because they were not constituted by second person interactions. They might be, that is, irreducibly alien. And finally, it might be that as we think about designing intelligence, artificial intelligence, if we really care about that being intelligence as we know it, with which we can interact in a community and into dialogue with which we can enter, we would want that to be an intelligence that was constituted in second person interactions. So the very design of artificial intelligence, if it's artificial intelligence that we care about, might require that we take the second person seriously. My hope has been to show you that even though we think so much about the difference between the first person and the third person, when we do that, we're making a terrible mistake. If we want to understand who we are and what human intelligence is and what other kinds of intelligences might be, how they might be similar to or different from our own, we have to begin with the second person. Thank you very much. Thank you.